right, Shabbat Shalom uh, to everybody who's joined us today live and those who are joining us on video. And uh, again, as I always do, um, if you are wanting to join us live with the community, uh, live when we do the teaching and meet some others, then come join us at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So wherever we are in the world, we do it uh, on our Saturday here in North America at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So um, wherever that is for you, that's when you come and join us. And uh, if you're inclined to, just uh, go to the rivershabbat.com website, hit subscribe, put your first and last name uh, into there, and you'll be on the community list. And uh, we will send out the weekly link as a part of our weekly newsletter. And uh, that will get you uh, connected to us, and you can click on the link to the upcoming Shabbat, which we post in that newsletter. So if you're inclined to come and join us, then uh, we'd love to see you. Okay. So, we are continuing our journey, and uh, we've been using the book of Micah as our compass, and uh, we've got here claiming the throne. This is uh, a very interesting uh, chapter in this whole journey, because um, you know, as we've been looking at this great prophet Micah, who was given to the southern kingdom, uh, leading up to what would be the judgment of Judah and what had just transpired in the northern kingdoms uh, with, um, with uh, Samaria and them being uh, judged, something was then going to come and make its way to the southern kingdom. And so Micah was positioned there somewhat like uh, Amos was uh, for the northern kingdom, warning them of this sort of what was coming if they were going to continue uh, to bring in to the father's ways things that shouldn't be there, this spiritual adultery. So we've got here claiming the throne. What is going on? Micah does something very, very special that sits in the middle of uh, sort of, I got the summary of Micah up there, and we've looked at the transgression and um, this, what was this transgression? And we linked this, that uh, Yaha may have had this complicity to tolerating things that he shouldn't have tolerated. And so what this would eventually allow is judgment was going to come to the house of Israel. And then, of course, we looked at this time of evil, the wickedness that had come into the house. We've also seen it in Rome. And obviously, it's very evident today. Uh, and then I really, we, we looked last week at the shame of the prophets. Um, and why are not his people that are supposed to bring forth the fruit of their lips, um, bringing forth the fruit of a warning? and of telling the people that we're not in the place that we should be. And of course, we see this um, happening very much throughout the body right now. But what's interesting, right in the middle of this, Micah shifts into um, these great proclamations that actually relate to the last days, and particularly in the coming, uh, and, and these great prophecies of the king. And he starts to allude to uh, these prophecies, um, and he set it up in the previous chapters. And so right in the middle of this incredible set of writings from Micah, at, at the middle of it, at the center of it, is Yeshua as a conquering king. And I don't believe this to be a coincidence. He's done this intentionally. He's setting the stage that everything I just talked about in the state we're in and, you know, uh, all of these things, we've got a king here who's coming to deal with matters. And you need to take this very seriously, House of Israel, <laughs> is what Micah was doing. And, uh, and of course, they weren't going to heed uh, his warnings and uh, his prophecies of judgment and whatnot as a result of all of this. Um, but it's quite interesting that he centers Yeshua from a kingly position, uh, I believe, in this place. And so uh, we got a, a little bit of an interesting journey uh, sort of around that um, as we look at the center uh, of the compass um, on this journey uh, from the great prophet Micah. So I've got this quote here from John Emmerich Edward, also known as Lord Acton. And he was an English Catholic historian, politician, writer, you know, um, but there is this famous quote, we may have heard it, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is a truth. This is a truth to the fallen. But if you have an unrighteous king, absolute power does not corrupt absolutely. You see, this statement is applied, this absolute power corrupts absolutely to us in a fallen state. We cannot handle the power of the throne. 
We cannot handle essentially being God. And there's a real sense that we're seeing this now play out on earth uh, as we see, see things being woven together. I've got this claiming the throne in question mark here. And I'm going to make a statement here because everybody gets sort of wrapped up in, in certain type of terminology, like, you know, new world order, you know, what's going on, great reset, all the stuff that's going on here. And I want to just make this very clear is the adversary that's allowed to be by Yah that is serving the throne has no intention of any earthly kingdom being the one and only wicked ruler. He intends to be the false Messiah. And so well, we're all worried about these things and we're seeing the nation shake right now. We're seeing what's happening in Russia. We're seeing what's happening in China. We're seeing what's happening in America. We're seeing what's happening in Islam. And we're seeing these great power structures of the earth and they're being brought together and they're shaking. And what Hasatan's doing is he's going to weave order out of chaos, but he's, a, he's, he's, orchestrating global chaos. And so from a Western perspective, we might think new world order, or we might think, you know, in this kind of term, but make no mistake about it. Islam is not in cahoots with that. Neither is China and potentially neither is Russia. And what the adversary or the God of this world is doing is he's going to weave a situation of such chaos that it is going to require order. In fact, the chaos scripture tells us is going to get to a point where men's hearts will fail them. And when you're at that point is when the so-called hero arrives. And this is the second of the final test that's going to be allowed by Yah that will be a sifting at the end of this age where their people will accept this false messiah. So the world, essentially, what you're seeing described in, the, in, in great prophecies concerning end times uh, that would be a part of the last days. Um, and since Messiah, we've been in the last two days. We're coming to the end uh, of almost the 6,000th year in this great plan of redemption. And you're seeing now exactly as scripture to prophesied, the nations are raging. The seas are raging. The nations are, 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 you know, saber rattling. We've got wars and rumors of wars. This is actually occurring. And this is being orchestrated by Hasatan. He has no intention of any one of these power structures on earth right now to be at the head. They may all be worried about each other. And that's the idea. So how do you bring the world to its knees unless you can pit fallen man against itself? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we're seeing this being weaved right now in front of our eyes. And so he's going to take this, according to scripture, to a very bad place so that we will need a hero. And Yah's going to allow this to see whether we are going to accept one that comes in his own name. And of course, of all of this with the theme of the claiming of the throne, a reminder to all of us in the house of Israel, as we look at these things and as the great watchmen of, of, uh, of Amos and Micah to the northern and southern kingdoms, uh, at this time and what they were doing, let us not mistake. And I would think, I would think that Micah would, would have this understanding very clearly. And we want to remind everybody here as a part of our journey that his loving kindness and his mercy and his forgiveness were not to mistake this for weakness. What we have coming is a king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we must get out of our minds this infeminate sort of Messiah that's been sown into the vain imaginations of religious dogma. It's not truth. And so the world is not only going to face a king, but it's going to need one, a righteous one. And so we're in the place now where we want to be in a place of repentance or teshuva to the king. This is important uh, for all of us to remember at this time as the house of Israel. Ezekiel 3, 33, 6, 7 puts it like this. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned 
and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, his transgression. Think about what we've linked to with here with Jacob in this whole series. What was the transgression? But in his blood, I will require, the, in his blood, the, I will require the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. And I believe Micah was a great watchman at that time. Where are they now? Where are they now really giving what the transgression is? What is Teshuva and that a king is coming? We're getting all this weird eschatology and, you know, different sort of theories and this and that and everything else, much of which is not anchored in scripture. And the people are not warned. So a great sword is coming. Show you something interesting here. Micah the watchman, he prophesied of an era of universal peace. He's actually talking about this reign of Messiah, a governor, and it will come from Jerusalem. We're going to get into this and look at a few things as we continue on uh, with Micah uh, as our compass. But basically, he's playing this role that when the glory of Zion and Jacob is restored, there's going to be an abandonment. We're going to leave this idolatry, this spiritual idolatry, as a result of a righteous king. And Micah, as the watchman, knew that this was coming. And in this part, in the center of this incredible set of writings, he goes to that place suddenly. So he's warning about the impending, the state of things, where it's going in the immediate. But then he goes right to a grand conclusion of the coming king. I want to read to you something interesting here, which I believe is an Ezekiel 33, 7, 6, 7 connection, which many miss. It's contained in Revelation 19. And remember what he says. He's warning of a sword. Look at how it's given in the revelation of Yeshua. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. Now think about what the watchman is told. If you see the sword warn. And we always think of this only in terms of the enemy coming to do us harm. We don't think of this as who is the sharp sword. Look at this. With which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron or an assured scepter. He will tread the winepress. That's an allusion to the fall Moedim. This is the grape harvest. And of the fury and the wrath of Elohim, the Almighty. He's getting a sense that maybe this is not the suffering servant coming this time. Okay? This is not the actions of somebody in that place still. This is somebody who has claimed, has taken authority of the heaven and the earth. The God of this world does not make him the king. It means he's an adversary that's going to be allowed to do his job for the purpose of sifting. And it will be a great delusion. And if we don't get this stuff out of the house, we can fall victim to it. But I believe Ezekiel is completely matching here in the revelation of our Messiah, what the identification of the sword actually is. And so we are seeing something, an illusion here, which many don't link, make this link. For me, it screams it. You can talk about many swords, many swords of an adversarial nation, position, whatever, individual. But the sword, the two-edged sword, is Messiah. And what if he's coming now? Should the watchmen do their job? We talked about a little bit last week, and I mentioned two things here, and I'm showing you the menorah and the, the chiastic structure of the letters that are laid out at the beginning of the book of Revelation and the seven kahal or the seven ecclesia or churches is the way that it's, and it's, it's given in the sense of a seven golden lampstand. What is interesting in the structure, the only two that were given a good report card, and I've got them in green there, green for go, <laughs> uh, is Smyrna and Philadelphia. And they are connected and the branch of this menorah. Now, there's no coincidence to this. And this is what's important when we understand the chiastic structure of the menorah, the nature of this, and how this is written into the book of Revelation. 
what's fascinating here, and we talked about this, is there was going to be, right at the end of these last days, a hijacking, essentially, of the tribe of Yehuda, a taking of its name, taking it on. But what scripture was warning about to these two that were getting it right, Smyrna and Philadelphia had nothing bad said about them. And this is coincidentally when something appears on both of them on this chiastic structure. And there's no acknowledgement of the rest of the house of Israel. And so I'm going to read this again now, because apparently these two that were getting it right are going to experience at the end a slander from those who are identifying themselves with Yehuda. And so they're actually going to experience something, an adversarial position come at them. You know, and again, as I said last week, synagogue of Satan conjures up all this devil worshiping, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's just simply saying because they've adopted or taken something that they shouldn't have. That doesn't mean they're not of another tribe in the house of Israel, by the way. It doesn't mean that we're against the modern nation. They have every right to exist like every other secular nation. But we looked a little bit last week that what was ruling over this place called the modern state of Israel, and it has in it occultic mystery Babylon religion ties in its ruling sense right now. That doesn't mean everybody's bad or, you know, all that sort of thing, or my Jewish brothers in the land and things like that. But what we're seeing in this modern state of Israel is probably elements of every tribe in the house of Israel will be there. But there seems to be this emphasis going on here by something that's going to become an adversarial position to the truth. And they're going to identify themselves with Yehuda. Now that makes sense because Messiah himself is going to be of Yehuda. So it makes sense that the adversary is being allowed to do it, hijacking the tribe of Yehuda. All right. Cause the attack is always on who it's Messiah. It wouldn't make sense for it to be any other name that got hijacked, you know, and they call themselves, you know, Ishikarians, you know, like it wouldn't make sense. Messiah is from the tribe of Yehuda. So you're seeing a link of how this is going to play out in its deception. How deep it goes is, is, is interesting. But this is interesting. One of the things they'll be involved with is slander to a part of the Kahal that actually is getting it right and has great bridal promises, has nothing bad said about it. And they go after them. It's interesting. The same thing happens with the Kahal of Philadelphia, Church of Philadelphia. Behold, I will make those that were an adversary of the gathering who say they are Yehuda and are not, but lie. I will make them come down before your feet and that they will learn, that they will learn as a part of these judgments coming, they will learn that I loved you. So even though they slandered you, even though they were provoked to jealousy, even though they didn't like what you were saying, I'm going to let them know that I have loved you. Doesn't mean he doesn't love them. He's going to make it known to them that I have loved you. Do you see the point? They stood in this position and he's going to show them. Oh, no, 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 no. You didn't quite get this right. And so this is interesting. And this is all connected on that. I'm just going to mention quickly here, because another fellow, uh, Eli, who was the high priest at the time of the portable tabernacle, just before the building of Solomon's temple, he got in all sorts of trouble. But Eli's the high priest, Eli and his sons, and this is, you know, um, basically they were serving in the temple, but it was corrupt. There's all sorts of things going on here. Um, it's actually quite shocking. <laughs> when you actually know what these sons were up to. All right. So, you know, pastor's kids, right? You know, <laughs> so anyway, sorry, that was, but what, what I'm saying is, is that it's, it's interesting that they were the ones that really should, but they're involved with corruption, stealing, embezzling, sexual immorality with it. Like, it's just, it's a doozer. Okay. And this is all going on, you know, in the house of Israel and with the, you know, the worship telling me, so you can imagine when he's going, you know, how's this stuff getting in the house? Anyway. What was interesting was that Eli experienced a reproofing and it came through the young prophet Samuel. Okay. And so you've got this thing where, where what the father was doing was using a wash and go, Eli, you know what? You tolerated this and look what your sons are doing. They're profaning the holy. Do you know who was held account by Elohim? Do you who was held? It was Eli. Yeah. 
You see, his transgression wasn't that Eli was doing this. His transgression was he was complicit to it. This is a warning to parents, to servant leaders, to husbands, to wives, to everything for us. Because if we, whatever we have an authority in, whatever we've been given to serve the Father, that authority has this attached to it. Have we become complacent in our own families, in our own marriages, in our own serving? What's going on here? Are we profaning the holy? And what is holy? And how do you profane the holy? It's very interesting. Amos is going to give us some insights on that. We're going to talk about this today. Because this is all going to link back that there is a king that's going, I run things my way, not your way. But what if we had gotten so polluted that we don't even know what his way is anymore? How do, what if we've been lied to by our fathers that we don't even know what we're seeing? Well, that's not complicity. Complicity comes when you know, and Eli knew. Yacham knew. Big difference. When you scorn my sacrifices, you come against them and my offerings, commanded from my dwelling, his sukkah, and honor your sons above me. Does anybody here honor their kids above Yah for the sake of, I want them to like me, to love me, not to get upset with me? It's a stunning situation when you really understand this. Eli was the authority, and what, what you're seeing here is Yah is holding the authority to account for the complicity. So there's an interesting link here in how we look at how the king does things. Interesting, he shares this with Yaakov. And then we looked at this region in the temple and, and when Yeshua came against the Sanhedrin, Yehuda at this time, almost 2000 years ago, and he's facing this. And he says to them, I tell you the truth. I'll destroy this temple in three days and raise it up. And I know people try and give, you know, a wider allegory to, you know, the, the thousand year reign and things like that. But really, if you just didn't hear, you just keep reading the scripture, what he's talking about. It's very clear what he's going to identify as the nails. And it's taken and they're going, well, it's taking all this time to build. You can do it in three days. I can do that. Messiah. No one can do that. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Just so you know, it's very clear what the scripture was identifying. It's as simple as us having the identification of the true temple going on here. And it was true. And he says, therefore, he was raised from the dead. Then his disciples remembered what he had said. And they believed, get this, the scripture and the word that Yeshua had spoken. They knew he was speaking about the temple of his body, the true naos. The heart, the true ark of the covenant. They knew this in that moment. And I know we try to make wider allegories and things like this, but the scripture is very clear. And the word being used there for temple, the naos of his body. Let scripture define our understanding of what was going on. And this is very important. I'll show you why as we keep going through this. Anyways, here's my little biblical hermeneutics eschatology chart. And what teachers do is they use all this fancy stuff to look intelligent. But basically what I'm, what I'm going to say is this, okay? Bad eschatology equals okay, bad theology, <laughs> all right? Or bad theology equals bad eschatology. Doesn't matter which way you want to say it. If we get leaven in the house, spiritual adultery, it plays with all of this. And now we have all sorts of things going on. And ultimately, it's corrupted his appointed times as a result. So where is this naos? Very interesting, 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, do you not know? So this is the words of Messiah. Do you not know? You are Yah's temple. Do you know the word being there used in the Greek is naos, not herion. Naos. That you are Yah's inner Holy, holy, set apart place, and Yah's spirit dwells in you. Now you know what the disciples were relating to when they heard and saw this event and this prophecy of the coming down of the temple and what the Sanhedrin just could not understand. 
they were caught in the physical what, the shadow pictures of it all. Second Thessalonians 2.1. Now concerning the coming of our master, Yeshua Messiah, and being gathered together to him, allusion there to Yom Teruah, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word or letter, seemingly from us, to the effect that the day of Yah has come. By the way, there are people right now, this is interesting, there are people right now that believe we're in the thousand-year reign. <laughs> okay? Now, <laughs> I don't know how you get there truly with Scripture, but it's staggering. And this is being taught in many believers that we're right now in the thousand-year reign. Scripture is telling you here right now, don't believe them. And then it goes in. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of Torahlessness or lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction. There's going to be a revealing. There's going to be something that comes. And he's going to be without the laws and the covenant of the king who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called Elohim or object of worship. So think of the religions of the earth, mystery Babylon, think of everything, think of the chaos and something's going to come in and, and go to it. Well, you were all kind of right. You were all kind of wrong. I'm it. And they're finally brought to their knees that they'd be willing to accept my dog. If, it, if the dog could help at that point. Look at this, who opposes adversary and exalts himself against every so-called Elohim or object of worship. And so that he takes his seat, look at this, in the temple of Elohim, proclaiming himself to be Elohim. Any guesses as to what the word being used there is? It's not a physical building set of grounds. It's direct relationship. It's naos. He will take his seat in the naos. If the naos is at the heart level, where do you think this is taking its seat? Oh, this is a heart matter. You better believe it. People are going to believe it here. Not all this silly eschatology being about building buildings and he's going to go in there and sit and everything else. Destroy this. I'm going to make this very clear about this. And I know many of you all know this, and some of you may be hearing this for the first time, but I'm going to reiterate this. The tabernacle, Moses, Aaron, Eli, that was sanctified. The presence of Elohim is recorded. Do you know what makes something holy set apart? His presence. Not our religious dogma, not our bad eschatology, not our vain imaginations. His presence in scripture defines whether something is holy or not. Moshe, take your feet, take your shoes off. You're standing on what? Set apart ground. There is nowhere he does not put his presence if it is physically and literally there that it is not set apart. The first temple, Solomon. We know that he set that apart. So we got the tabernacle. We got the first temple. The second temple, there is no record around the time of Darius the Great, none, that that temple was ever sanctified by Yah. So we don't get to call it or identify a true naos in it because the Holy of Holies in that temple was never experienced the presence of Yah. Herod's temple, same thing. At the time of Yeshua, almost 2,000 years ago, Yeshua did not recognize the naos and the thing that he was telling to be judged. If he had, he wouldn't have pronounced the judgment. He's saying, I tell you the truth, I'll raise up the true naos here because whatever's in there is not it. How popular do you think that was with the Sanhedrin? <laughs> I'll tell you how popular it was. You can go read about it. It's called the death, the crucifixion of our Messiah. No way are we listening to this. Now we've got modern eschatology is telling us a fourth temple is going to be built. And this is the thing that the Antichrist, he's going to desecrate the naos in something where there's no record, nor could there be, of Yah giving it his set-apart stamp of approval. And that's, of course, we think he's going to come down, visit it for a while, and then leave again. Somehow that was missed out in Scripture. 
I don't care what they build right now. I don't care if they build a thousand. They may actually build something. I don't know. It might fall, bring into the part of the great deception. But I can tell you this much. It will not fulfill the scripture. That whatever comes is actually going to affect the naos. Not some physical scene. It's going to be at the heart level. Build whatever you want. It doesn't make it set apart. There's one more temple mentioned. We read, we read about this, the last eight chapters of Ezekiel. We only actually have record of three set-apart temples recorded in Scripture. Plus the real one that they were all pointing to. The shadow picture of these three are all pointing to something. He's even given the last thousand years in an incredible way to point to what the real thing is. And he desires to have his covenant written on the ark of our hearts. All of this is a shadow picture pointing to the weightier matter, including the last great day, the last thousand years. Okay, let's read chapter four, because he's going to suddenly jump from warning in the present. And now he's going to go right to the prophecies that are going to relate directly to the claiming of the throne. Who has their Bibles? Okay. Starting in chapter four. And in the latter days, it shall be that the mountain of the house of Yah is established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And the people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up on the mountain of Yah to the house of Elohim, of Yahab, and let him teach us his ways and let, him, let us walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth Torah. And the word of Yah from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many peoples and reprove strong nations from afar. Just in case you didn't know what we're talking about, it's the millennial reign. It's the thousand years. Anybody who thinks we're in the millennial reign right now, I'm wondering how that's happening. He shall judge amongst the many peoples and reprove strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. No war. I think we can really pretty much at this point rule out that we're in the millennial reign. <laughs> Have we beaten our swords into plowshares? Anybody seen that lately? And their spears into pruning hooks. In other words, you're going to get back to farming the land and you're going to learn how this teaches about my appointed times. They're all agricultural in nature. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither battle anymore. Just in case you're still hanging on to we're in the millennial reign, please <laughs> just reread this part of my God. But each one shall sit under his vine, under his fig tree. No one to make them afraid. Remember that. No one to make them afraid. Apparently, we got an indication of a safe scenario going on, almost like a hedge. Just park that. From the mouth of Yah of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each one in the name of his mighty one. But we walk in the name of Yah Elohim forever and ever. In that day, declares Yah, I gather the lame. I bring them together, the outcast of those who have afflicted. The outcast. You mean he's going to restore that which has been scattered? Interesting. I shall make the lame remnant and the outcast a strong nation. And Yah shall reign over them on Mount Zion from now and forever. Okay, if you're still hanging on to that millennial reign thing we're in right now, <laughs> I just, we're just, this should be over now at this point. Everybody realizes that he's reigning over from Mount Zion. It's literal. And it's the last day of his great 7,000 year plan of redemption. And you, O tower of flock, stronghold of the daughter of Zion, it shall come to you. The former rule shall come. The reign of the daughter of you shall I am. Whoa. Anybody see a bridal illusion going on here? Just 
It's amazing when you start to look through a marriage covenant perspective and his appointed times, just how much sense the prophets can make. None of them left that understanding. They only knew it from that position. It's us that have forgotten. It's us that were taught lies from our fathers. Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no sovereign in you? Oh, now there's an allusion to a king. Why are you crying? Is there no king in you? <laughs> Has your counselor perished? By the way, these, this is being rhetorical. <laughs> okay. Some Micah sarcasm. For pain has gripped you like a woman, ooh, in labor. How does he describe before the coming of the king? That it will be given birth as such as a woman in labor. Interesting. Birth pains. Be in pain and deliver, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you are to leave the city and you shall dwell in the field. So now he's jumping back right to where they are now. We're doing the opposite. We're taking what he was talking about then and we're experiencing it now. So we're in reverse. We're looking at what he was addressing. Then he went forward. Now we're looking at what he was addressing and we're in the forward. And so this is really quite interesting how the prophets help us so much today and will give us so much wisdom for us to take now. And you shall go to Babel and you shall be delivered there. Yeah, I shall redeem you from the hand of your enemies. This is the prophecies that were about to come uh, affecting Jerusalem that would be approximately 130 years later. And now many nations shall be gathered against you who are saying, let her be defiled. Let her eyes look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts. And now he jumps back to this interesting place again. Now he's going to go forward again. Now he's going to look at his appointed times. But they do not know the thoughts of Yah, nor do they understand his counsel. For he gathered from the sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise, O thresh, O daughter of Zion. For I make your horn iron and your hooves bronze, and you shall beat many people into pieces. I shall seclude their gain to Yah and their wealth to the master of all the earth. The king is going to claim what is his. And he is going to take the seat. Everything screaming here as he's dealing with an impending judgment and warning. He is likening to the return of Yeshua HaMashiach. And it's anchored in the fall Moedim. And this is where it becomes very, very interesting when we start to continue on just to look at some neat things here or connections. Let's see if we can make any. In Daniel 7.25, you know, I always like to raise uh, the, the primary target of the enemy. So the great prophet Daniel makes a statement. This is what the adversary is going to be interested in doing. So our opinions don't matter. What matters is what was revealed in his word to his prophets. And I suggest we take Daniel seriously here because he's not kidding around. He shall speak words against the most high. By the way, this is in the house. Intentions not mentioned here. Our good intentions don't save us. He's going to speak words against the most high and he's going to use our religious environments to do it. And he shall wear out the saints of the most high. Look at this. And shall think to change the times. The actual appropriate, again, this is, you know, just in the English. But if you do your homework in the Hebrew, seasons, appointed time. And the law, the decrees, the Torah, the covenant. And they shall be given into his hand for a times, times, and half a times. This period of great tribulation or birthing. Now, these visions were being given around concerning the fourth beast of the great vision, a statue of Daniel. The Roman Empire's eastern and western legs and then the ten toes. And this is when the rock would come and smash them. This is in direct relationship to the last days. The last two days. This great empire. 
iron legs, and then they would be mixed with iron and clay in its feet. In this time is when he's going to seek to do that. If that's the primary target of Hasatan, as I always say, do you think we might be interested in why he's so interested in polluting this? Is it possible the very thing he's going after is the very thing? That is the thing that leads us to understand repentance, that leads us to understand truth, that leads us to be able, and that he's wanting to bring the spirit into this truth. If you were Hasatan, I can't think of anything else I'd go after. If the whole plan of redemption is laid out in his appointed times, in his Moedim, I can't think of anything else I'd go after more if the target was to sift from those who are not truly interested in who their Messiah is. They want to make him up. Look at this. In Daniel eleven thirty two. he goes on to say this. He shall deuce with flattery those who violate the covenant. He's going to itch their ears. Oh, that's been done away with. Don't worry about it. But the people who know their Elohim shall stand firm, as Paul would say. Stand in the armor of Elohim. Stand in our faith. And take action. Very interesting. And of course, in chapter 11, some of the great chapters of the, uh, of the end times. So the revealing of his plans in his appointed time. So we're on this, this period where we're leading up now to the fall Moedim. They're still in dress rehearsal mode. The spring uh, appointed times have been fulfilled. They're no longer in Moed or Moedim. Individually, those Moeds are fulfilled. So the Moedim of the string feast have moved on from dress rehearsal to fulfillment. This is how in the Hebraic system it works. You get a dress rehearsal. I want you to start to practice something because it's going to teach you. It's going to be a tutor. We see this laid out in Leviticus 23, where the commandments are to honor these eight appointed times that are listed, all kicking off at the Pesach meal. Then there's going to be a fulfillment by Messiah himself. You don't know how to honor something unless you have the fulfillment. So you can be in a dress rehearsal phase, and many kids do this, don't they? They play dress up, you know, they, you know, dress up and whatever their favorite thing is. You'll see them, they'll put on their little superhero costumes or whatever it is that children want to do. They play make-believe, they play dress up. But when they get older and experience what it really, what really happened, what it really meant, now they can honor. A four-year-old child cannot honor the anniversary of the wedding of his mother and father. He doesn't have the capacity to. But as they get older and they understand that this was an event that was actually fulfilled and is now in play, suddenly that child can start to honor his parents' wedding anniversary. It doesn't mean it's gone away. He's in the house that has the covenant. And all of this goes on to completion. So what Yah's done is he's given, I want you to look at it this way. They're going to be fulfilled. Then you will know how to honor them. This is why the fulfillment of the fall Moedim must take place before the last and final great day. The last thousand years. Because all of the earth will have experienced the fulfillment in the king and the one who's on the throne. In other words, you will know how to honor it now. I still see to this day my brethren in Yehuda. They're still doing, you're coming out of Egypt and they're doing their setter plates and all this kind of stuff. And none of it. They're still in Moedim because they do not recognize that Messiah came and actually fulfilled it. And so they're still in dress rehearsal mode. But those of us who know that, that this all spoke of Messiah and that he fulfilled them, we're now honoring it. We now know how to honor it. Because we've witnessed and have record of and know and understand its fulfillment. Now we can do the Pesach in an honoring way. Now we can do the week of unleavened bread in an honoring way. Now we can honor the first of the first fruits. Now we can honor Shavuot because we know what happened. And now we can honor this properly if we'll go back and look at what actually occurred, not our vain imaginations. And so now we're in a place where we're able to honor 
they spring Moedim, that were Moedim, that are now in a fulfilled state, that are in play. And they'll be in play right to the end of the 7,000 years, because all of these will be being honored in the millennial reign in the last thousand years. And they will have a king on the throne, the fulfillment of them, and his truth will go forth from Zion, just as it says, his Torah. And in Leviticus 23, this is very cleared out what his Torah was. He wants us to get to a point where that honoring is at the heart level. It's not plain dress up. And so we get the great fall Moedim. There's a very interesting thing here. We get the fall Moedim. There's a catching up or a gathering. And then we get into this wrath of Yah. It's almost as if he puts his bride away for a second and says, I'm going to hide you if it for a little while until the indignation is passed. In other words, I don't want you to see this, honey. This is not going to be good. He's actually sparing her from this. It's very interesting. Something's going to go down on the earth. Because Yom Kippurim, the judgments, are coming. And he's doing something very serious on the lead up. And the descriptions in the, in the word are very, very serious. Our Messiah is kicking major butt. And this is all needs to occur and happen with the judgments of Yom Kippurim, the sheep and goats judgments before this great fulfillment of the wedding feast. Because the wedding feast is what actually kicks off the claiming of the throne on earth. He doesn't plan to do it alone. This is why I'm focusing a little bit on this thing we call tabernacles or Sukkot. So where's the deeper? Where's there something more in this? This is interesting. Amos in the Northern Kingdom says this, and this is his warning to the Northern Kingdom, the 10 tribes. Okay, by the way, that's probably our journey, historically, spiritually. This is his warning. I hate, I despise your appointed times. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. I don't take delight in your Sabbath gatherings. I don't take your delight in how you celebrate the appointed times. Whoa, 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 whoa. How popular do you think Amos was at this point? Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings and your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. This is Amos to a people who are doing the appointed times in the northern kingdom of Israel, and Yah's not happy with how they're doing it. Is this sobering? Don't we get to just blame the Christians? Oh, this must be talking about Christmas, right? Well, I can tell you that the northern kingdom wasn't interested in what you see as modern day Christmas, but I can tell you what they would be honoring. And I can tell you that they brought something into the house. How can I do that? Let's keep reading. Anybody notice if you just keep reading in scripture, sometimes it actually starts to just, you know, give us understanding of what it's saying. I often have to say that to myself and others. Okay, let's just keep reading. <laughs> Let's let scripture interpret scripture. So he goes on to say here, chapter 5, 24, 7. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness? It's rhetorical, by the way. Oh, house of Israel. Did you do it? Did you bring this manna? You send in the quail? Did you set this all up? You got a sense here that there's a rhetorical nature going on? What do you think is so special with your efforts? I did this all in Sinai, not you. And look at this, what gets identified. You shall take up Sikuth, your king, Kayon, the star god of your images that you made for yourselves. The identification of the deity there, the Babylonian deity, is directly related to the Assyrian Babylonian god of the planet Saturn. By the way, that's where you get the term and in the modern Gregorian calendar, Saturn day. Do you mean his appointed times are going to get polluted with things that shouldn't be there? Well, you think of Saturday it comes from Saturn day. Now I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I'm definitely doing this at Sukkot this year. This gets very serious as to what's going on. What were these deities that they brought in? What were they doing to the father's appointed times 
that he would get to the point where he says, I hate them. And there's some connection here to star images and links to the worship of Saturn deities. What's going on? By the way, they're about to be judged. Gone, scattered, just like it said, prophecy. You're out. Anyway, for those at Sukkot this year, I'll be taking uh, because it, it, it actually gets serious and it's very disturbing and it's sobering for all of us to understand at this time. So as we approach this and as we looked at that, we're hitting for the his appointed time of Sukkah. OK, so this is the way you would say it. We say Feast of Tabernacles in the English or we might say Feast of Sukkot, things like that, because we uh, use the plural form of Sukkah. The actual way this is given to us in Leviticus is his appointed time of sukkah. Sukkah. His sukkah. Not ours. We have a shadow picture when we gather together, and we have many of them together, and we're all in tents or cabins or whatever. We have, you know, uh, the plural setting of sukkot or sukkahs. But what's actually here, and he makes this clear, these are my appointed times. This, the, if you really want to say this, according to the word correctly, I am honoring through a dress rehearsal his appointed time of sukkah. This is the time of ingathering. If we're going to be technically correct as to what's given to us in the Hebrew. But why are you laboring this, donkey? Well, there's some interesting things that go on with this. His appointed time of sukkah. So this is recorded in Leviticus 23, 24. The root word of sukkah is interesting. It's a feminine noun. It's sukh or sok. Well, this is fascinating because it's not found in many, very, very many areas of scripture. You can catch it in the Psalms and David and what he's writing and in the great prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, remember whose words were going to spare Jeremiah when they were going to try and hang him up? Just before the judgment, interesting. These are the places that it's used. Here's what's interesting about it. The definition of, of sulk, or sulk, um, thicket, hedge, lair, covet, booth, tent. There's where it's interesting, though. The root of sukkah is a masculine noun. It's bridegroom in nature. So think, these are my appointed times. These are his appointed time of sukkah. Very, very, very interesting that there's this masculine noun at attached to this. Just hold on to this. Soak. There is used in Psalm. I'm just going to give an example of two of them that I'm showing here. One is used in the blessing position by Yah. So think of Torah. You have, there's cursings and blessings associated with honoring his ways. We see this listed out and given to us in the Torah where he describes the cursings and blessings. This is fascinating. In Psalm 27, 5, look at this. For he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent, his sulk. Interesting. Singular, masculine in nature, his sulk. We'll see, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the way that they used to describe it in many other ways. But here's what's interesting. He will lift me high upon a rock. Who's identified as the rock in the Brit Hadashah? <laughs> so we've now got a wedding, thousand-year thing associated with this, you know, celebrating Feast of Tabernacles. And the root word of sukkah is sulk. And there's something now that's being attached to Messiah. And there's something potentially attached in bridal nature. You'll lift me high upon a rock. By the way, in the ancient marriage, uh, Hebraic marriage covenant, the bride lifts up and presents his groom. He presents her. My bride has made herself ready. Let's keep going. The adversarial position used by Yah. This is recorded in Jeremiah. 25, 35, 38. You mean that the sook can go the other way? You better believe it. No refuge will remain for the shepherds, nor escape from the masters of the flock. You watchmen aren't doing your jobs. A voice cry of the shepherds and the wail of the masters of the flock, for Yah is laying waste their pasture. 
This thing's going to get judged. And peaceful folds are devastated because of the fierce anger of Yah. You're corrupted. Look at this. Like a lion. Ooh, who's the lion of the tribe of, Yah- of Judah? <laughs> this is interesting. Direct relationship here to Messiah. Like a lion, he has left his lair. The word there used lair is sok. He's going to leave his sok. For their land has become a waste because of their sword and for the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Very interesting. Again, being associated to the position or the place of the Messiah, of the king. Is somebody going to get invited to the sok? (laughs) And who is that? I discovered something very interesting, which I was excited. You know, just I get excited about this kind of stuff. It's just my weird nature. But just something interesting I discovered when I was looking at Job 110. There's an interesting word that's being used here. And the adversary is kind of in the presence of, of Messiah. And something's going to happen here. Something's going to be offered up. This word, suk is only used twice in the masculine single, both in Job, in this encounter with the adversary, and in Hosea regarding horror. So it's being used to keep in and to keep out. Remember, there's going to be those who are outside the gates. Those, okay, think in this term. It's very interesting. Only twice in the masculine, think his appointed times. It's used five times in the singular, and yet its definition alternatively means and is used exclusively in this way, in the feminine singular, anointing, the anointed. (laughs) The anointed is where the feminine is being used in this same word. I found this interesting. What's going on? So what what does sukh mean? Well, the definition of sook happens to have a very similar definition to soak. This hedge to fence up, to either be able to keep in or out. Very interesting. So we have a similar type of feel as to what's going on here. They are different in Hebrew, but what is fascinating is their understanding in the Hebrew definition have allusions to the same sort of thing, covering, protection. In this case, it's more on hedge and fencing to keep in or out. I found that fascinating, especially when we consider the actual account. In Job 8, uh, uh, Job, uh, 1, 8, 11, this is what it says. And Yah said to Hasatan, have you considered my servant Job? Okay, so Job's getting offered up here. Notice that he's not even on the radar in Hasatan's, in the adversary's mind, Job's not on the radar. Why? Is interesting. Hasatan's going to tell us why. He's going to tell us why Job's not even on his radar. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth. He's blameless, upright man who fears Elohim and turns away from evil. Then Hasatan answered and said, Does Job fear Elohim for no reason? Look at this. Have you not put a hedge, a sook? protection in other words he's untouchable this is fascinating he's in an untouchable position one of two places used in the masculine this hedge being put around him the other is you're not getting in from a whoring position in hosea around him in his house and all that he has on every side you have blessed the work of his hands his possessions, and have creased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Now, Job did have some self-righteous issues, and Elihu, from an unrighteous position, was going to reproof the so-called righteous position, and this plays out later on. It doesn't mean that Elohim wasn't going to use this offering up to deal with, with the heart circumcision of Job. He was. But it doesn't change the position of what Hasatan was identifying. 
You've got a sook around him. How the heck can I get at him? So this has a literal spiritual connotation. At this level, we're talking the true spiritual protection is going on. But is there a link to coverings, protection, or a sook that is going to come, the sulk that is going to come? And is it possible that there is a connection here that actually honoring his ways can bring protection into our lives? Not just physically, but spiritually. Does this exist? I'd suggest to you that this connection of, of a sook having a similar definition, at least in the masculine, is no coincidence. And how I believe it is actually connected to sook, or what we would consider his appointed time of sukkah. In Deuteronomy 28, uh, 40 in the Torah, this is talking about the cursed position. You shall follow trees throughout your territory, but you shall not anoint. Here's the feminine. You shall not do this for your olives dropped off. You're spiritually adulterated. By the way, this is what the kingdom of Yehudu was about to face. This is what Amos, uh, sorry, Micah is trying to say. It's what Amos had reflected to the northern kingdom. You shall your fathers and daughters, but they shall not be yours for they shall go into captivity. Interesting. And we, of course, see both the northern and southern kingdoms were to go into captivity. Again, the word being there used, you shall not anoint. Sook. You shall not try and put up your own anointing. You anoint yourselves. What was Samuel known for? He was going to be the one that was going to deal with Eli and Eli's transgression. What was he really known for doing? As a prophet, he anointed kings sent by Yah, King David, of course, David. I'm going to suggest to you this as we work through this. And again, I'm going to go through uh, a deeper dive and an understanding of this because some of the links are stunning as it gets into how this can possibly be reflected in what we're looking at and seeing in the modern day religious realms, both in Christianity and in modern Judaism. Who says here in Zechariah, great prophet Zechariah in 2, 11, 12, says this, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares Yah, and many nations shall be joined to Yah in that day. And they shall be my people and I will dwell in their midst. And of you, and you shall know that Elohim of hosts has sent me. The kings on earth. And you shall inherit Yehuda, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall, true, and shall true, choose Jerusalem again. I'd suggest to you that we've got a description of something, this last and great final day where the king is present, that we're heading for a thousand years of sukh. Because does anyone remember who gets locked up for a thousand years? Who doesn't have access to the kingdom? Oh, now we see the Job connection. A thousand years of sukk. So is there this thread through sukkah, through sulk to sukk? I believe there is. At least in the sense of protection. The Job connection in Revelation 2, 3 here. And he laid a hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Hasatan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. The last great day fulfilled. Interesting. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Now this is the last and final safety. Notice how I said the false Messiah coming was the second to last test. This is the last. After the thousand years of Sok or Suk, this protection, the king is present. He's with his bride. There is right ruling occurring. After all that, everything has been given for the possibility of heart circumcision, the circumcision or the ark of the covenant to occur. Now the final test happens. 
because we're heading to eternity after that. The final role of the adversary is going to be allowed. But I believe what he is saying when we honor these Moedim, and I believe the actual appointed time of Sukkah is actually telling us that there is a direct link to his position, his tent, his place. And if his place has a direct link to protection, then in the physical, there could be a protective blessing in honoring his appointed time of Sukkah. But in the spiritual, we could be heading for a thousand years of protection under the king. Remember why Hasatan couldn't see Job? Because of the protection. And look at this, for a thousand years, guess what he's not going to be able to see? He's locked away. There is a hedge of protection being put around this spiritually. And so we have the physical that is pointing to the spiritual. Do we wish to want to honor his appointed time of sukkah? And if it was pointing possibly to our wedding, how dare we claim the bride and not be interested from a dress rehearsal perspective? If this is possibly pointing to even physical protection right now for us when we celebrate these things, would it be silly to disregard such a thing? And if it was all pointing to the weightier matter that we have a king who's going to claim a throne and provide a protection or a hedge around the spiritual deceptions of the adversary he allowed to exist. Our blessed hope, waiting for our blessed hope in the appearing in the glory of great Elohim, Savior Yeshua Messiah, who gave himself to us to redeem from all Torahlessness, lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Real bridal speak where those who were zealous for it. His appearing is not us disappearing in these rapture <laughs> doctrines. It's about his appearing, not us disappearing. <laughs> okay? This is the claiming of the game. The whole thing's been reversed. Yes, we will be caught up to him in the fulfillment of Yom Teruah. But that's not until after the great tribulation. Claiming the throne, the lion. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse, the one sitting on it called faithful, true righteousness. He judges and makes war. He has to do this before he gets married because you know the groom cannot go to war following the wedding. Ah, that might explain a thousand years of sook. <laughs> his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head he had many diadems, And he has his name written that no one knows. Well, there your sacred namers are in trouble at this point. No one knows. Well, silly arguments going on out there. Keep reading. High priest claiming the throne he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. I encourage you to go watch um, uh, as he was slain, Elohim in blue. Incredible what's being uh, represented here as he comes to the actual fulfillment of Yom Kippurim, the judgments around the great fulfilling of these fall Moedim. So the Moed of Yom Kippurim has a literal fulfillment. Look at this. And by the name which he called is the word of Elohim. And what's his word? A sword. And what was right at the beginning of the teaching today? What were the watchmen supposed to do? The sword is coming. And it is that sword that will judge the nations. And it will come from the mouth of our king. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine and on white pure following him on white horses. In this incredible time of Yom Kippurim. Claiming the throne, the king, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, king of kings, master of masters. Make no mistake, it's a king coming. But he's going to bring something from heaven to earth. Do you remember the prayers? Do you remember what we were told when the disciples were asking, how shall we pray, master? The very first thing that comes out, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The one that you don't know yet. <laughs> the one that he's got written. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Notice what this is. Present tense. 
your kingdom come. So it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is his kingdom, and he's taking the position for the last and final play in his great plan of redemption that he is going to bring the kingdom that he operates all authority of all the earth, and he is going to give a physical representation of this under a protective hedge with the adversary locked away for a thousand years, and then one last sifting. It's a king. Make no mistake about it. Newsflash for everyone. He's already claimed the throne. He's on it. And he's bringing it. Get ready. King's coming. In Revelation 2, 11, 12. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Has conquered. So that he can open the seven seals, which are the lead up to this great birthing pains for the coming of the king. This is a kingly reference, not a servant reference now. King's coming. Let's finish there. We can come back for, for some Q&A and uh, go get a coffee or do whatever you need to do. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.